It's Wednesday, let's chat. Hi, I'm Kanan Chandran, the publisher of StormAsia.com and this is our Wednesday web chat series, the Wed Web Chat. Uh, this is the last session for this year and uh, what we'll be doing is taking a look back into what we've been through and also looking ahead at what's to come. Uh, 2021 was uh, meant to be a year of recovery to come out of the uh, COVID saga and the pandemic. The COVID virus had something else to say about that and we are still stuck in it. We're still, you know, sort of uh, plodding along trying to figure out what the COVID's next step is going to be and it looks like a long drawn out process. Meanwhile, many things have uh, happened to the economy, uh, to people, to industries, to companies. Um, some have uh, managed to take advantage of the situation and uh, developed innovative products that have helped, been helpful to their own cause as well as to society. Many others are struggling and, and struggling along. Um, so for us, what lies ahead? Um, today's uh, panelists will be looking at different sectors, but also coming together to discuss uh, issues in and around our look back at 2021 and the look ahead to 2022. Our panelists today, we have uh, Jameis Lim, who is an Associate Professor of Economics at the ESSEC Business School in Asia Pacific. Uh, he's uh, been very busy of late, uh, but he's here in this capacity and we want to hear his perspective on what he thinks of the economy uh, and where it's going. Uh, he used to be the Chief Economist of Third Rock Group and in Investment Management and Wealth Advisory, uh, a Lead Economist at the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority and before that a Senior Economist with the World Bank. So he's very familiar with all this forecasting and looking ahead and looking back and making sense of things. So we will get some rich insights from him. We've also got uh, Ku Sui Yong, the Chief Investment Officer of uh, Casa Singapore. Uh, Sui Yong has been uh, one of the regulars on this uh, series and uh, always good to hear his point of view on the property market and other issues that are going on. Um, now, the, his new uh, entity, Casa Singapore, is a real estate tokenization platform licensed by the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, he's also still the owner and CEO of his international property advisor, uh, a real estate broker and asset management company. Um, so, Suyong is also the author of uh, six books on the Singapore real estate market, uh, and uh, so he's well versed in this topic. And uh, we've got Edwin Yeo, who's uh, with Cornerstone International Group. He's a regional head for Board Practice Asia, and he's a CEO and managing director for the Singapore uh, operation. He's got more than two years of leadership development and executive search consultancy for international, regional, and corporate clients. And uh, he's got a broad range of work experience as well, uh, covering a variety of industries. Uh, and he contributes to many voluntary and community and charity organizations. Great to have all of you here. Um, this is a 45 minute session, so it's going to be short, sharp and uh, sweet, but we've got a lot to cover because it's been a busy year and we are looking forward to what's going to happen next year. I just wanted to start with, uh, you know, there's a sense of optimism that Singapore has about what's to come, that we're going to emerge stronger from the pandemic. Uh, I'd like to get from you, if, what's the justification for this sentiment and if it's uh, really, you know, something that we can go by? Would you like to start that off, Jameis? Sure. Uh, once again, thanks for taking the time to, uh, over lunch time, to, to, to spend this time with us. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm going to approach it, obviously, from a macroeconomic perspective. And so when we look at the macroeconomy, uh, really, of course, while it's easy to find clear pockets of weakness and, and challenges. Uh, even in, in these clear pockets of weaknesses, uh, there have been improvements. Uh, so for instance, uh, when, we, when it comes to the construction sector, which had struggled quite a bit since uh, 2020, uh, we've seen that this, this is one of the sectors that had recovered uh, most robustly uh, in recent quarters. And then more, taking a step back more generally, when you look at the economy at large, uh, we are currently on track and, and in my view, uh, we are most likely going to beat even the upper end of the MD MTI forecast for real growth in the economy. And if that's true, it just goes to show that uh, the rest of the economy has uh, steadily remained re resilient through, through this process uh, and is on track to uh, outperform in the year ahead. Now, of course, there are going to be caveats. I'm sure we'll get there. 
the, the two big ones, of course, is to the extent that uh, the reopening process may be interrupted by the Omicron uh, variant, uh, together with uh, clouds that come from the possibility of rising inflation. And again, I think we, we might uh, end up uh, guiding our discussion in that direction. Overall, I, I share this sentiment. This is something that I have felt uh, already since the middle of the year about uh, the possibility that we will end up on the high end of our national forecast for growth. And, and this has indeed uh, most likely will, will be the case. Jumping in on what Jameis has said, it is actually very odd um, to the, the, the visuals on the ground. I mean, the numbers I'm looking at, um, population, two hundred and thirty two thousand out of our five point seven five point eight million we, we actually had population drop but yet um, the measure of growth that you were mentioning probably is only in reference to GDP growth right yeah so yeah, it was always it's, it's a I'm a macro economy so yeah and how much of GDP was actually um, boosted because of inflation because of the higher value of chips because of the higher value of let's say pharmaceuticals it is not the total number of pieces of chips uh, or number of pills that we have manufactured has increased tremendously it's actually per pill the dollar value has gone up and that's why we can have a improved gdp but yet employment uh, of locals or even overall jobs growth i mean we've got tens of thousands of ambassadors now walking around. And when we go back into a more normal type of situation, are we able to find uh, sufficient jobs to for these tens of thousands of ambassadors who are roaming around? So for me, 2021, I must admit I got my forecast wrong because I'm looking at it from ground up and I just can't see how in 2021 we were busy buying HDB flats and busy buying new property launches as well. Home loans have grown by 11 billion over the last year. That's a 4.6% home loan growth in a year. And I don't know, maybe that's why MAS recently also sounded an alarm. Edwin, you know, you're in your area where you're hiring people, what is the reaction been to what's uh, this sort of expected growth in Singapore's figures? And what has been the real sentiment that you've uh, you've heard from from the people that you've been working with? Yeah, thank you, Kanan. Um, at the end of the day, it, it's never homogeneous. So Sui Yong has uh, certainly uh, hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, I, I eat at hawker centres every day, and and the number of safe ambassadors is mind boggling. I mean, <laughs> there's so many around, <laughs> and they and they and they go around in groups like wolf packs, you know, trying to catch people. Um, but uh, the, the, the irony is, the irony is, um, business has never been better for me, because at the level of the seniority that we work with, the number of employment has risen. Uh, people are still coming in to Singapore, overseas, and even big SMEs and large companies are hiring. Um, the, the lack of talent uh, is, um, is always obvious. And at the end of the day, um, this is the time to catch the talent because you have them already available. So those who are far-sighted will go out and get them first uh, in anticipation of being ready uh, for the upswing. So, so it's always a two, uh, two tiers. And one end, you have the great resignation and the great retirement. But at the other end, you have people who are scrounging and hunting for talent. So, so it is really not homogeneous, uh, but you just have to, to live in the tier where it is more positive. Do you, has, has there been a lot of uh, adjustment in terms of how people's uh, standards of living uh, have changed? Uh, are there more people going up a lot, downsizing? I mean, when it comes to things like properties, are they buying to... Uh, to downsize or are they buying to improve their position? Um, have you seen any of that or are you able to comment on that? It's a little bit more of a FOMO that's driving the purchases. Uh, so that exceeds uh, right now what we are seeing in terms of downgrading or right sizing of um, the retirees. But according to me and my students' forecast, we are likely to by the year 2030, have uh, more deaths than births at around that turning point. And 
this aging population, uh, starting from last year, we have got about 50,000 people celebrating their 65th birthday. And these numbers will grow. And so in, within the next 10 years, I think you will see more and more people who are selling their, because they are right sizing. But in the last 18 months, it has more been a formal sort of thing where the delay in construction got some people a little bit more urgent and they are putting their money down early. Hmm. So it's a ripple effect, right? The fear of missing out. So you need to go out and get it just in case something worse kicks in. Um, is there that sense that it's just going to get worse? Uh, is that hanging about in the air? Uh, are, are people feeling it really? Uh, that part, I'm not sure whether it is a real fear justified by market numbers because if we look five to ten years down the road, the demographics trends um, is really not uh, with the buyers today. Uh, so they are, they are buying into a relatively high price and high risk uh, situation now because the next ten years of new home buyers, that cohort has shrunk. I mean, 20 25 years ago, I mean, already we know that our childbirth uh, numbers are low. So uh, the demographics is definitely against us going forward. I think uh, there's no doubt that uh, in terms of dem demography, uh, at least not just in the simple context, but uh, more generally in, in a lot of high-income countries, uh, there is a head clear head headwind and, and the trending down. Uh, but at, by the same token, I would say that, in fact, uh, this phenomenon of uh, relatively high, since we're talking about real estate, relatively high uh, real estate prices uh, is actually a global phenomenon. This has been the case uh, regardless of whether it is in Singapore, which is primarily an urban setting, or in, uh, in other countries where there are, in fact, rural or, or suburban uh, properties, which have also been elevated. Uh, a big part of that, of course, is that uh, as uh, disposable incomes have risen because people are not spending as much on services and so on, uh, the impression I get services to travel for, for in, in particular, uh, people are uh, spending it more on durable goods as, as well as housing because they spend so much more time at home uh, and, and making decisions uh, on upgrading. So I think there is definitely a, a bit of a psychological shift as well uh, in terms of what uh, individuals feel is comparatively important. Like. I think we need to be cognizant of the supply demand imbalance as well. And we do not need to look very far, just drive up to Woodlands, take binoculars and look across the water. And we can see like the 90% vacancy in the newly built condominiums there. So there is always the possibility of oversupplying a market without having sufficient warm bodies to fill up the real estate. This um, spending, this high spending of high price uh, luxury goods, the, the, the tier for uh, property is, is one level. But if you look, you look at spending for luxury goods, you, you can feel it on the ground. You're wondering why people have so much money now. If you, I mean, there, some people explain it away, you know, the, the, the middle income and, and higher has nowhere to spend their money. They can't travel. They don't spend on air tickets. They can't shop abroad. And what do you get? Anecdotal research, you walk to any Rolex authorized dealers, they have nothing to sell you. Nothing. Okay. You walk into uh, Hermes after queuing up uh, outside their shop, long queue, then they will tell you, oh, you can't buy this. You can't buy that. And so it, it is a really, really strange phenomenon. It's COVID, but you have money. And, and what the Hokkien will say, you have the money, but you can't buy anything. It, 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 the demand is phenomenal. Oh, but at the same time, and Edwin, I'm sure you know from your work with the charity groups, um, uh, the report recently that came out was uh, saying that we've got, what, 300,000 uh, people who could not get two warm meals a day. So the disparity and the break uh, of the haves and the have-nots have actually gone wider. Absolutely true, both uh, domestically, it's something that was raised, I think it's not just about uh, meals. I think uh, there has been some emerging evidence if you look at uh, DBS data on uh, individual saving accounts and what's left behind. Uh, it has been the case that uh, the lower half 
of, of the social economic spectrum, uh, they have been hit comparatively hard uh, by the pandemic. Uh, they are living more on paycheck to paycheck. I, I meet quite a bit of especially low income individuals that are really struggling. Some have lost their jobs, especially those that are operating more on a gig or, or odd job spaces. And now on the other hand, you have uh, rising incomes, uh, which as, as we've all discussed, uh, is not being as easily spent uh, with the usual kind of consumption of uh, services and, and so on. And so uh, th this bifurcation uh, happens in Singapore, but it also happens, it is also a phenomenon that's happening uh, globally as well. So I think uh, it, it is definitely an emerging trend. Uh, and one will hope that uh, over time, we will start to see some of that re a reversal of this mm. processing. You know, usually with uh, in times of crisis, right, uh, it's an opportunity for people to come together, uh, band together and, you know, push forward. But um, I'm not sure if we've seen that in this crisis, you know, based on what you've just said, uh, there's this, the, the divide is growing. Uh, what can we do then to resolve that or try and reduce that gap? Okay, so on... <laughs> In a similar vein, then we are we we all agree that the the ground and the fundamentals are shifting, right? And I don't think that the ground is set or is going to set anytime soon, especially because of this recent Omicron spread. So I see the fundamentals changing, but what is the new fundamentals by which we could produce another ruler to measure our growth or to measure and to do some forecasting for next year, I, I'm really still looking for a few of the indicators that I might be confident to start using, right? So my outlook for next year, I mean, I think inflation will be here for a while uh, unexpectedly, and the supply chain unexpectedly is jam, jammed up somehow. Mm. Um, and then this other concern of mine about potentially uh, an increase in GST next year because of the this this parliament wanting to come to uh, a, a balanced budget, say, by the end of this parliament. Uh, that would be my concern for just the next 12 to 18 months. Hmm. Uh, if I may echo that, I mean, obviously, uh, an increase in the GST uh, is, is, in fact, I think, uh, both potentially premature, but also um, a, a negative drag on an economy that is still uh, on its way to working out uh, the dysfunction that was introduced as a result of, of COVID-19. So I think there's a need for quite a bit of patience. I think inevitably, uh, given the way that uh, this particular government has already made it clear that uh, there is an intention uh, to not just raise the GST, but to make good on, on the deficits that were incurred. Uh, so I think that that aspect, um, if if no alternative sources of revenue are uh, identified and, and, and passed through legislature, I think that would definitely be the case. My personal view uh, is, is that there are, in fact, certain alternatives that we can look into if we do believe that the uh, those in the higher socioeconomic classes have done comparatively better. Uh, certainly one way uh, would be through, well, uh, I'm, I am on record for pushing for a, a wealth tax uh, for, for the highest income earners. But even if you step one step down uh, to those that are not the very highest, but still a relatively high income, uh, the uh, looking at options for another tier of uh, additional buyer stamp duty in, in property uh, may be uh, something to, to think about, to, to explore. And, and, and th there are, in fact, other uh, subsidiary benefits that could come from, from this kind of uh, exploration, not least uh, thinking about how we want to also quell some of the uh, excess speculation in, in the property market, as we were discussing earlier on. So even while employment might still be a bit uh, uncertain and iffy, um, your inflation as well as GD, GST that will add on to inflation, the disposable income of the middle and middle to lower, even though they are employed with steady income, but their disposable income, I'm sure, would also take a hit. 2022 might be difficult for many of these families. I'm involved in a few uh, not-for-profits, um, I think what tangible, what is tangible, what we can do 
to help minimize the gap or alleviate those who are at the lower end is uh, is what someone told me uh, a few months ago. He uh, co-founded a charity and said, wow, you know, you have time and you know, you, you are very good. And he said one statement, one statement, we can't depend everything on the powers that be. Sometimes we have to take action. So I think these are the tangible things we can do to help those at the lower end of the spectrum. And, and, and these are things that's real. And, and whether, whether the GST goes up 2% next year, you know, following it, we don't know, we can't control. But what we can control is what we can do. And we can, in a small way, alleviate the pain, the hardship of those at the lower end of the spectrum. So it's essentially just taking uh, your own, uh, uh, taking control of your own life to some extent and helping those you can help, right? Uh, and is, is that something that uh, I, I, I would have thought that at times of crisis like this, that a lot more of that would be happening. So maybe there are more charities uh, forming as a result of it, but it also sends a signal that all is not right if you need to set up so many assistance groups in that manner, right? So uh, is that going to be a fallback, a security blanket for many? Ah, well, okay, we've got this comfort level, so we can carry on like this, or are we going to still try and push forward as a result. I mean, what, what's, what's the mentality that you're sensing uh, on the ground and at, at, the, at the levels that you uh, function in? You mean, you mean the, the, the recipient of uh, the beneficiary? The recipient as the beneficiary, yes. Yeah. Okay, I think the first thing that I will say, it's not easy to set up a charity. <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> it is quite onerous. The paperwork is horrendous. Um, and you can quote me on that. Uh, so, so a lot of charities, you have two ends. One is the people who support you, the sponsors, the people who gives you grants, um, the, the finances, and then the people you, you help, the beneficiaries. It is very, very, very dangerous for the beneficiaries to think that way because a lot of the flow through is very tough. So, so we just try our best. The, I can tell you, given our situation, our environment and our culture of how charities are set up and what charities can do, all their challenges, all their limitations, um, most beneficiaries don't actually wait for us. They will move on, they can't, because we have nothing to guarantee them until we get our things off the ground. Mm. Okay. The, the only point I'll add to that, uh, maybe a little bit about government policy and public policy in terms of the social safety net. Uh, and there, I think um, the qualification criteria uh, for getting some of this support uh, tends to still be quite stringent. Uh, usually, it's uh, income levels that are uh, quite low um, on a household basis. And, and on top of that, uh, that often is a very hard cutoff. So once you exceed that income threshold just by a little bit, uh, you are a whole bunch of potential assistance schemes are no longer uh, available to you. So um, in some ways, the, perhaps uh, ironically, the very poorest, say 10 or 20% of society, they do get a fair amount of support in terms of public housing, in terms of uh, support from the social services office. But where I think Singaporeans are, are struggling really is in the say 20th to 40th percentile of the population. And, and there uh, really what, what they are finding is that uh, not only are they not able to uh, avail themselves of, of some of these uh, sources of support, um, as uh, Su Yong has also mentioned, they are also struggling with uh, other incremental costs, the impending GST, the, the fact that uh, they, don't, they don't get any vouchers or any, any, any of these little freebies that come along their way. Um, and then reduced income because you know if they are say um, drive a private car hired driver the business just isn't as good as, as it used to be uh, and then finally um, they, they they of course are, are struggling to to with the possibility of rising prices which uh, in my view at least uh, is something that will be some that will at least be with us uh, through to the middle of next year so that, that even if we don't continue to see an escalation, inflationary pressures, at the very least, uh, prices will remain elevated before uh, gradually coming down as supply chains 
ease and so on. Uh, I guess uh, it's also the issue, we've got the issue of the aging population, right? And we've got a lot of people who are retiring and they'll be living off savings. Uh, and how how long that those savings can stretch for, we, I think many of them will be struggling uh, after a few years. How will that group be, be managed, do you think? Would they fall into this group where they would be in that 10-15% which would receive assistance? So my, my view is a number of them, a number of people who would otherwise retire would have postponed retirement precisely because uh, circumstances, job circumstances, do not uh, allow them to, to retire that early. Uh, if they were to face some kind of unexpected household uh, shock, so maybe one of their family members gets sick uh, and so on, then then the, once Medisafe is trained, then immediately they would need to uh, provide additional support. Uh, so I think in that, in that regard, uh, it has been tough for them. And of course, for uh, their working age children, they have had uh, also to uh, supplement uh, these incomes. So m my personal view is that the elderly, um, to the extent that they, they are drawing down, perhaps disproportionately, if, if they are already retired, for instance, and they're living on, on a, a CPF amount that they're drawing down, um, they will have to face that uh, sometime down the road, of course, uh, if, they, if they are going faster than they originally anticipated in terms of their balances what we call the great retirement. The retirement has very various facets as in all things and they have extremes. I mean, those who choose to retire and those who are forced to retire. So for example, because of COVID, you run a, you run a hawker store and the rules keep changing and you have no business, people can't eat in, they sometimes can eat in and then become two to three then become, then they choose to retire. But can they afford to retire? They are forced to retire or if company downsize, they are forced to retire because bad business due to COVID. Can these people afford not to work? So it, it is a very delicate balance on when you talk about retirement. There is those who choose to retire and then there is those who are forced to retire. And um, of course, the government is trying to raise the retirement age and hopefully the corporations uh, go into that mode by using them for what they can do in their old age, that's great, uh, but it's it's tough. The, the retirement question needs to be looked at in more detail. And, and if I may just add very quickly to that, if, if there is a precarious group, uh, actually I would argue it would be those that are relatively older, so in, in perhaps in their uh, 50s uh, or, or early 60s that aren't quite ready to retire yet, uh, but because of various economic conditions have been uh, prematurely, if you will, uh, let go from their, their jobs. And these are the ones that uh, really struggle because, uh, you know, they, they, they would almost certainly be unable to return uh, into a position that would have, uh, at the very least, a, a comparable amount of salary. So many of them have to take a step down in terms of their incomes. Uh, I met a number of these, they, they often resort to uh, kind of gig uh, jobs where, they, where, they, where they're trying to, to make up for, for, for this uh, lost income, so you know, yeah. drive a private hire car and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think uh, this this group of kind of prematurely retired ones, that will be a group that we really have to pay attention to. Uh, in the yeah, year. yeah. And, and, and they are underemployed, you know, they are categorized as underemployed because they are not, they are not uh, employed to be able to use uh, the skills up to their potential. So, so that's what happens. I think just to throw in a data point, uh, CPF's annual report uh, about from last year was that 63% um, of about two thirds of people who hit 55 years old last year had um, sufficient in the retirement, sufficient money in the retirement account, but that included the real estate portion of uh, what is uh, counted into the retirement account. So, still 30 over percent, 36 percent, they are not even at the minimum sum that required. Plus, in this uh, already retired cohorts, whether you use 65 years old or 55 years old, um, don't forget that there are quite many, especially the 70 to 80 year old ones, where the couple only has one uh, income earner, the other one is a homemaker. And therefore, uh, 
their, their savings as a couple is actually they would need family support. Otherwise, they need the job. Okay. Um, just um, take a step back towards the original intent of the discussion. Uh, could I just ask uh, what were a couple of things that you learned from 2021 and maybe even from 2020, uh, which you feel would be important as you step into 2022 and beyond? Perhaps I will give you a, a six-word phrase. Um, <laughs> Summarize. I think what I've learned is um, the six words would be hang on, keep going, be ready. Hang on. It, it will come to pass. Things will go back to normal. Don't worry. <laughs> keep going. Don't give up. Don't be too, don't do too much of a knee-jerk reaction if possible. And be ready for normalization. Because I mean, you look at the 18 uh the, the, the 19th century Spanish flu, 50 million people around the world died. 50 million. We are in a much better environment, condition, scientifically and medically more advanced. We will get through this. So we, we should not look at the problem up to the tip of our nose and forget to see ahead. Because that will be very, very dangerous. And then when the thing comes back, you are not ready. So, so, so that's my my little uh, phrase. That's a rather optimistic take on it. And uh, your, your, the assumptions here are that uh, things will return to a normal that you are familiar with, but it might not. It could be a normal that you will still have little control over. And I also feel that, you know, sometimes you may want to look ahead, but you still have to go through the stuff that's right in front of you. Right? Sure. Um, so relating Edwin's point to um, a future normal uh, to real estate, uh, the n next normal might be that uh, convention and exhibition centers got to be radically downsized. And the next normal might be that because we are now forced to use apps so much, we are carrying shopping malls in our mobile phones, that retail shop space, uh, unless you are selling a service at your retail shop, uh, you are hairdresser, uh, you are selling F&B services that actually retail shop space could be shrunk by, I don't know, 20% and nobody would know that it has gone. So that if we could anticipate what is the normal to get ready for, then yes, let's all get thinking along that line, right? But I think the ground and the fundamentals continue to shift. So to anticipate what might be the normal that we would return to, I'm still struggling with that. So I ob obviously don't want to undermine uh, this optimistic note that Edwin had. Uh, <laughs> and I think it is for our own mental health and the mental health of society in general, uh, it is important that we have uh, an optimistic take on, on how things will unfold. Mm. Uh, with the caveats, of course, uh, that Kanan, you said, that we still have to deal with the, the present reality. My take uh, on this has been reasonably consistent over the past uh, year or so, which is that uh, the pandemic has, if anything, uh, ultimately accelerated a number of trends that were already in the process of unfolding. So uh, international economists in particular have uh, often argued that the world had been uh, ever since the 07 08 financial crisis, have been seeing a period of relatively decelerated globalization, both in terms of international trade uh, in goods and services, as well as uh, international capital flows. Uh, what the pandemic did, of course, was put, put a nail, death knell on the third important flow, which was the flow of labor, uh, as well as migratory flows, both temporary in the form of tourism, as well as more permanent. And some of these uh, are unlikely to completely reverse. I think there is a greater sense of a localization. There's a sense in which we need to shorten and build more resilient supply chains. And even the micro level, uh, something that we all mentioned yeah, in terms of housing, uh, commercial real estate, I think, uh, will never, uh, well, never is a very strong word, but commercial real estate uh, looks to have quite a different future from what we mentioned earlier on, which is resident, the picture for residential real estate. Uh, so these are all certainly things that I think will continue to uh, evolve uh, in the years ahead that were in some ways 
a function of what had unfolded over the course of the past two years since uh, COVID visited us. And, mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, I think it's important that we then take this trend seriously and, and um, not just see, take them seriously, but also plan for a future where these trends may potentially uh, be with us for an extended period of time. You know, um, my view is that some of the me mega infrastructure projects uh, that we have thought about uh, here in this country, including expansion of our airport um, to a new phase, including a, a, an expansion of our seaport. Um, these may be something that we need to consider whether uh, we want to scale back on, on some of those ambitions, especially the airport. The seaport, you could argue, uh, you know, global shipping uh, did collapse, but then uh, if anything, in, in more recent times has, has uh picked up in a fairly robust fashion. So I think these are certainly things that we have to look at uh, in, in total as we, as we look to the years ahead. My question then to Edwin and perhaps also to Professor is, for example, we have done well as a country attracting MNCs to invest um, by giving RHQ, RHQ, OHQ status, we give Pioneer status, but with this, work from anywhere sort of arrangement where global talent, a data scientist that is really in high demand anywhere in the world, they could still be employed here, but but the physically they are not working here. So the, the old model of attracting MNCs and then getting the MNCs, the incentive such that they create jobs to employ people here, uh, the, the, the people may not be employed here anymore. What are your views on that? Two aspects of, about the MNC model. One has to do with uh, what they bring in terms of uh, foreign direct investment and physical capital, physical and, and, and financial capital. There, I think that model uh, is more exhaustive. So I am uh, of the view that that reliance on, on capital accumulation, which had served Singapore very, very well for half a century, uh, is mostly exhausted. And that's why I think I'm not alone. Um, in, in pointing this out, that uh, we need to move toward uh, an economy that is more focused on productivity and, and raising uh, the overall productivity of our workers, especially in our knowledge workers. Which then brings me to the second point, which is that it is true that uh, people can work from anywhere, uh, which is why Singapore has to be an attractive place to live and work. Uh, so I think that model can still exist. Uh, we can continue to leverage. Uh, some things we cannot change, of course. Uh, some, some of us may not enjoy this, this weather, the heat and, and so on. So that, that, and unless we build a globe, globe around, a dome around Singapore, that, that won't change. Uh, but uh, insofar as what we can offer in terms of uh, a good place to raise a family, uh, for our children, safety, importantly, um, but then we also need to re-examine whether certain other aspects which have led uh, certain people to leave, things like the pace of life, uh, the, the kind of uh, educational challenges where uh, it, you know, children really need to constantly engage in supplemental uh, tuition and so on or be left behind uh, to the detriment of other uh, more creative aspects of, of the, the curriculum. So I think all these things uh, can be re-examined in order to make Singapore truly a place that uh, continues to attract. And I think we can. Um, importantly, once, once we get a handle on, on the fundamentals, things like making sure that housing prices uh, are not running way ahead of median incomes, and of course, for some of these global talents, um, even for some of the global talents, uh, our housing is increasingly unaffordable. Thankfully, we still have comparatively cheap and delicious uh, food. Like, like Edwin said, you know, our hawker food is uh, world class. I'm very proud of that. I'm very, uh, you know, I, I hope that this will continue. Um, yeah. But that that comes with a holistic view of of the contribution of all of these different components in the economy to the quality of life that we uh, live in. Yeah, at the end of the day, we have to hit the high value work, whether it is capex intensive capex or knowledge. Um, I mean, it, it, we, we cannot bring the hands and legs factory to Singapore. We are just too expensive. In, actually, we are just, we are just living. 
right? They go Batam and so on and so forth. But we still have chances. Look at look at Hyundai. They are going to set up an EV factory in Singapore, and that's big news now. But everybody is excited. Whether they will sell it in Singapore or not, we don't know. But everybody is excited. But um, you know, this knowledge worker thing is a double edged sword because if you are a knowledge worker, you can sit in Singapore or you can sit in Delhi. It doesn't matter, and it's cheaper in Delhi, right? But what is not what you are not able to do is that you cannot be based. You cannot have an, a business here and not engage your customer. Asia is engine of growth for many years, and we are still sputtering along, but we are still growing. If you do not have a presence here, physical presence, you will not be able to compete with your competitors. And I say this because of my experience. The number of new hires to be regional heads based in Singapore is mind-boggling. I tell you, I have not so much business until the last one year. And that is good for Singapore. We believe that we can be the springboard. We can be the hub to the spoke for Southeast Asia for Asia. So, so I, I'm very, I'm very optimistic. You know, I'm just wondering, Edwin. You you talk about all the regional heads coming through. Is that a push at one end, or is it a pull from the Singapore side? Uh, I believe it is a combination of both, but uh, more of a push from the uh, corporations because we, 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 we don't see this, but a lot of big American firms, a lot of European firms, more American than European, they are very insulated. They are very domestic. They don't need to go out of the world to do business. But then they realize, oh no, my next door competitor has a big operations in, in, in Southeast Asia, in Asia, but, and they're making tons of money and they're not doing anything. So they are being pushed. They are being pushed. I mean, we know the big US firms, we know Coca-Cola, we know IBM, but they are a very, very small percentage of the number of corporations in US and the rest are just very, very US. So they are being pushed out and that's good news for us. They could be cited anywhere. They could be cited in Singapore. They could be cited in Kuala Lumpur. They could be cited in Hong Kong. Uh, but for various factors in play, I think most will cite their offices in Singapore. I uh, just wanted to get from each of you uh, a take on what 2022 is going to be like for you. Do you think it's going to be a good year or a bad year or a meh kind of year? <laughs> Jameis, would you like to? Yeah, my, my take note? on 2022 is that um, relative to 2021, uh, it will probably be, be better. In fact, the second half of 2021 has already been better than the first half of 2021. So I see a continuation on this process of recovery. But uh, that said, there are clear dark clouds uh, in the horizon. And the dark clouds, as I mentioned, uh, as in fact, this panel has discussed uh, elements of in inflation, which uh, will show up and, and will be with us for at least a certain period of time. Um, if we see a slowing of that rebound, um, that rebound has been reasonable but not um, the same kind of rebound i think our economy had enjoyed uh, relative to previous uh, recessions you know if you think back on on the kind of rebound we had uh, after the asian financial crisis for example or even the global crisis they, they were really solid rebounds uh, this has been a little bit more plodding uh, in part because of course uh, there has been a stop and go uh, reopening processes uh, when it comes uh, to the element so and, and of course you know this is a little bit beyond economics, but uh, if we end up with yet another variant, uh, even worse than Omicron, which is at least so far proving to be a little bit more benign than, than initially feared, uh, then really all bets are off, right? Because then uh, you start to see a reintroduction of all, all manner uh, of, of, of restrictions, which of course would uh, then lead to a tanking of the economy. So, yeah. I see into the crystal ball and there are many mixed signals and I think the crystal ball is a bit murky mixed signals uh, from, for example, very high valuations and PE ratios of companies. But at the same time, um, employment, cr the creation of real jobs that are long-term careers seem to be still not there. So uh, I'm, 
I'm not sure how 2022 will go. It might end up like like 2021. Mm. So tread carefully, um, but keep treading because you have to start <laughs> mapping uh, the, your surroundings so that you can you you can know where the map is. The, the map is now not clear. Mm. Edwin? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm the eternal optimist, um, but I will look back and th I think a lot of people forgot 2018 was much worse than 2019. 2018 was much worse than people forgot that because they got overshadowed by COVID. So for me, my outlook uh, based on the trend of the past year, 2021, I think things will be much better. There is a new normal. People are more used to what's going on. We are aiming for endemic. So I, I feel and I, I assess that people are sick of hunkering down. So they have to go on. It's business as usual. We just have to fight whatever comes along. And I think it will be better. Even with just that mentality, it will be better. Of course, uh, barring any unforeseen, unexpected big bump in the road, I think it will be better. If we had a medicine to cure this, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. The, 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 the pill, right, that uh, can save us all. Is it a red pill or a blue pill? <laughs> ah, well, if one works and the other is necessary after that, I guess with an aging population. <laughs> uh, so, so, Edwin, uh, Su Yong, and uh, Jaber, thank you for being in this session and uh, bringing your perspectives into the discussion. Uh, it's It's been a strange couple of years. Uh, I foresee maybe uh, a bit longer run with uh, this uncertainty. and But it's interesting to, in that as you take the journey, you never know, quite know what's around the bend. Uh, so sometimes it can be a bit of a nice surprise. And uh, we're heading to the year end. Uh, we still, for now, can have some small parties and stuff like that. So hopefully we take full advantage of that and have a great uh, year end and the year ahead.